Hey guys, today we're on episode 13 of the K Nation Movement Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Today we have a very special guest, Mark Bell. We're going to be discussing keto, powerlifting, and everything in between. If you want to check out our supplements, you can head to www.knutri.com and shop the full K Nutri collection. Enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Yeah, so I've been following you for a long time. I've listened to a lot of your podcasts um, on other people's shows. Um, I've listened to you on Andy Frisella. There's been a couple shows and, you know, I've, I've loved your background of how you get started and, and kind of like your resiliency through the whole thing. But how did you get started in powerlifting specifically? I mean, was there a time like when you were younger and you just said, like, I want to get big and strong? Uh, I started powerlifting because my uh, both my brothers were into it. And uh, my oldest brother, uh, Mike, he got into some just kind of heavy lifting, um, just weight training in general uh, when he was young to uh, get stronger for football. And so my dad bought like a set and we had some stuff in the garage. It's kind of a typical like a uh, Sears kind of setup, you know, one of those um, uh, kind of multi-station things, leg extension on one side, lat pull down on the other type of deal. And uh, so we had some of that and I messed around on some of those things when I was really young, probably like 11 years old or 12 years old. And then um, my brother Chris had uh, just kind of born with like his knees were like bow legged. He had a lot of knee pain. And so he ended up having uh, knee surgeries when he was very young. He was probably like 15, 16, something like that. And he had these surgeries done. And, uh, the doctor that he went to when he came out of the surgery said, the only way you're going to be out of pain is to be strong. And he said, you know, you're going to have to learn how to squat and just happened to be that the chiropractor that my brother went to to rehab his knees was a power lifter. And he was like, hey, you know what? You're going to have to, uh, you know, start squatting with this broomstick on your back. And my brother went from doing that um, to squatting around 675, I think when he was like 18, 19 years old. Jeez. Uh, also competing at like 220. You know, so my brother was very, very strong. And he, and now, you know, he's had double hip replacement, both knees, both surgeries, uh, surgery on both knees. And uh, today he sent me a video of him squatting 405 for a set of five. Uh, pretty easy training with Michael Hearn down in, in Venice. So both of my brothers were a huge part of my uh, of, of me getting into lifting uh, in the first place. And then, um, you know, I just, I, you know, I, I uh, got competitive with them and, and wanted to put up points on the scoreboard. And I left them in the dust at some point and just turned into a, turned into a maniac. But I loved powerlifting from the moment the moment I touched the barbell. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you guys have, I think, inspired a, a large generation of, uh, you know, young and old uh, to just get stronger and really push, I think, the limits, whether it's in powerlifting or any other sport. With uh, Slingshot, did that come about because you saw uh, holes in powerlifting and you saw opportunity in making that sport like better or more efficient? I saw a hole in my chest is what I saw a hole in. <laughs> I, I tore, tore a pec muscle and uh, wanted to try to think – of a concept that would allow me to train, you know, through and around this injury. And so, uh, the slingshot was kind of born off of a torn pec. Uh, I always say I'm probably the only patent holder that had to tear his pec to come up with an, an invention, but, uh, that is the truth of it. And, um, you know, I'm very proud of it. It's a great product. It allows people to handle more weight in a bench press. Um, it also helps people with their form and technique by pulling the elbows in, uh, close to the body where they should be. And it also is something that's very protective. So uh, anyone who has shoulder injuries or had a shoulder surgery, elbow problems, pec pain, um, any pain really uh, while bench pressing or doing push-ups or dips, uh, it's a great product to help solve a lot of those issues. And in addition to that, it ends up being a great uh, item to help you to lift more because it utilizes a uh, training method, which is just to really overload the body. Um, known by some by uh, also called the future method, which is like, I can do that weight in the future without that apparatus. And so we've had people tell us that story of, yeah, man, like I couldn't believe it. I did three plates, you know, in the bench press with the slingshot on. And then sure enough, eight months later, I benched three plates without the slingshot on. So a little bit like a lifting belt for your upper body. You know, we know that we've known lifters that use lifting belts or that use knee wraps and they lift more weight when they put those things on. But over a period of time, they also lift more weight when they take those things off. It's not like they're all of a sudden reduced to uh, squatting 225 when they squat over 600 pounds in a pair of knee wraps. Yeah. And so uh, this is going back to 
my history with how I started with, you know, certain powerlifting things. So I started doing just bodybuilding movements around high school. Um, before I got into high school, I remember a kid, we were just joking around on the playground and he, he pushed me to the ground and I guess my shirt flew up and he started making fun of me cause I was fat. Mm. And, uh, you know, that was like, that triggered me wanting to get big and strong for the rest of my life. And it's always in the back of my head, no matter how small of a thing it was, he was just joking. He was actually a good friend of mine. He still is. But, uh, you know, he was just poking fun and I was like, damn, like I gotta, I gotta do something about this. So, um, luckily I had an older brother and he was uh, big in the gym and he just wanted to get big and strong. So I followed suit and then, you know, he told me a lot of times, like, you know, you can try to keep up to me, but you won't be able to. And I think he was trying to fuel that fire even more, um, as an older brother and they typically do. So I started getting to the gym and, uh, towards the end of high school, you know, I, I was benching three plates and I was 17 years old and I wasn't that big, but I just, mm. I loved what I was doing, that feeling, that confidence of, uh, getting to the gym, knowing what you're doing and being able to push weight, I think was probably the, the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, a few months after that, I started learning how to snowboard and I had a really bad accident. I oh. flew into the ground. Uh, I was going way too fast for a beginner and I just completely cracked my collarbone in half. And with that, um, as I'm sure, you know, the muscles of the pec and the shoulder, they insert into the collarbone. And so I tore off a lot of my pec and my shoulder. Um, I started, you know, my, my posture was just way different. So, uh, getting into the recovery process was a little bit of a challenge because you can't do anything, right? You're in a sling, you're immobile. And so I started getting back into the gym a few months after I was cleared and it, it was never the same going and doing it a bench press, which is such an isolated movement that requires stability on both sides. I just, I could never get to the same weight. I actually used the slingshot to bench uh, for a long time after that because it helped me just stay tight and kind of distribute the the force evenly on both sides. Um, but powerlifting is a tough thing, uh, definitely. And and did you ever find that it took uh, any tolls on your body? I'm sure that it did, but is there a way of kind of pushing yourself to that limit without causing any damage? Um, you, so it depends on what you're talking about. Like, uh, so to set an all time world record, uh, yeah, you got to push yourself pretty, pretty far. Um, from a mental perspective, I believe it's important to push yourself beyond and, and not even push yourself, but have someone else push you beyond where you thought was possible. It's a great idea to have someone encouraging you and coaching you to lift more weight or to do more reps because it's really hard, like just like active release therapy or any sort of therapy that you do to your body. Look, you, you can you can be your own therapist and you could solve a lot of your own problems, but who wants to go through that pain, right? And and even just thinking about like just uh, emotional pain, you could sit down and you could rationalize with yourself. And you can have a conversation with yourself about your relationship with your mom or your dad or someone who abused you or whatever it is. You can work all these things out on your own. But who has the courage, who has the strength to really do that? That's that's a uh, way too painful to do something like that or or to even confront the person and talk to them and say, hey, this is the pain. Right. So anytime it comes to like going through pain, it's like you kind of need you need help. You need you need support. You need some someone. Um, you know, we, we also here at, at super training gym, obviously we wear like belts and knee sleeves and stuff. And those things help as well, because the, the pain, the, you don't want to be blunted by the pain. You don't want the pain to shut down your workout. Um, on top of that, you need someone to give you a little boost. You need someone to shove you into doing some of these things. And I see a lot of people will try to do things externally with like music or with, um, pre-workout supplementation to get kind of hyped up for a workout. And those things are okay, but they're kind of fleeting. You know, they don't, they are not like long lasting. Uh, the music can really kind of help encourage you to push yourself uh, quite a bit, a little bit like a training partner could, but no one's going to be able to push you, you better than, uh, having someone by your side to kind of force you into some of these situations and to say, uh, look, man, you know, absolutely hundred percent, you need to go heavier. And then you might say, well, you know, I think, you know, I think I tweaked my back on the last one. And then you can make a conscious decision together and say, you know what, you're right. That's not a great idea. But if you're trying to push your body to, to have, if you're trying to push yourself to have a better physique, um, and to be healthy, you don't need to necessarily push yourself like a crazy person. Um, you don't really necessarily need to go to failure 
You don't necessarily need to do a lot of assisted lifts and things like that. Um, you don't need to be yelling and screaming in the gym and going through tons of agony uh, just to have a nice body. Um, but to break a world record or to step on an Olympia stage, uh, those are those are different things. And I think that you have to do that in order to get there. Now, I'll go back to the mental side of things. If you want to be if you're using strength training as a means to be healthy in terms of fitness and in terms of your mental capacity and you're trying to build that mental capacity, then I think you also need to push through uh, some boundaries and some barriers uh, because uh, I don't know how else you can build uh, mental, quote unquote, mental toughness. I don't know how you can figure out how to overcome a lot of life challenges without handling the weight and the resistance that you face inside the gym and overcoming it over and over and over again. Uh, you go to do a deadlift and you, you know, you guys are doing sets of three and someone just loses their mind and they do, they're supposed to do four Oh five for three and they do it for six. Well, shit, man. Now the ante has been upped for, you know, for everybody in the group and everyone kind of takes note and everyone's like, damn, I, I need, okay. That's the kind of day it is. All right, well, let's, let's go for it. Let's do it. And that doesn't make people stronger, uh, necessarily just in the gym, that makes people stronger throughout their whole lives. That gives you that gives you strength for whatever pain and whatever things are going to come your way because you know how to deal with things a lot better. And so there's there's kind of a I guess the reason why I'm I'm saying it and, and framing it in this way is there's there's a lot of different goals out there. And if you are 40 years old and you just want to lose 20 pounds of fat, um, maybe you don't need a full fledged keto diet to do that. Uh, however, it'd be a good idea to remove a lot of sugar. It'd be a good idea to remove a lot of starches and it'd be a good idea to find some good, healthy protein sources. But do you need to be on some crazy strict diet just to drop 20 pounds? Probably not. Probably just start moving around a little bit more than you used to and probably eat less than you used to probably ditch some of those bad habits, get some more sleep and you'll probably be on your way. But you don't, I always want to share that message with people, uh, that, you know, you don't necessarily have to kill yourself the way that you might see me doing on my Instagram, uh, or you might see some of these, um, like bodybuilders or powerlifters doing. Right. And I think, uh, and that's why I appreciate even the simple things like 10 minute walks, um, for anyone that follows you and they see your 10 minute walks, it, it's as simple as that. I mean, there's always a starting point and it never has to be pushing your body to the limits to that's, get in a gym or to get any physical activity in hundred percent. It's a buildup. You're built, you're building upon something, you know, but like bodybuilding is such a funny, funny term, you know, body built, like that's physically what you're doing. That's exactly, that's so descriptive of what you're doing. You're building up your body, but you can think about it when you're knocking out these reps and knocking out these sets and knocking out a lot of this work, that you're also building your mind. And I want people to really understand that. And I want them to know that the workout doesn't have to start out being so crazy or so hard. You can start out with a walk. You can start out with some of these things. It does need to progress. It does need to get hard. There has to be a point where things get more difficult. But in the beginning, if you're new to it, take advantage of that. And don't worry about trying to solve all your problems all in one week or in one day. Um, you know, start trying to do a little bit of cardio training. Start trying to do a little bit of weight training. Start trying to embark on a diet. But not all three things need to fall into place right at the same time. Uh, every time. So just, just damn it. Just do the best you possibly can with it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, that's a good way of putting it. You know, not everything has to come at once in terms of exercise and diet. Uh, I remember when I first started, I probably started bodybuilding in grade 11 and I got in the gym and I had no idea what I was doing. I really didn't. And I was 145 pounds soaking wet and I was the smallest guy in the gym, you know? And, and luckily I had people around me that told me like, listen, the consistency is what pays off. There's going to be people that get in the gym. They're going to get frustrated and they're going to leave after six months. They might be bigger than you now, but if you just stick to the course and you do it year after year after year, after three, five, ten years, it's impossible for you to not be at the very least where you want it to be. Are, and uh, I found that. Have you ever stopped yeah. before? Have you ever stopped training? I did, yeah. When I went to university, um, I wanted to become a dentist. That was my goal at the time. And if you want to become a dentist, you have to study a lot. You really have to put everything aside. Like anything else in life, if you want to get to it, you have to completely devote your time. And so that first year of university, um, I probably put on 40 pounds. 
And I was probably in the most anxious and depressed state I'd ever been in my life because I came from a background where I was student athlete of the year in high school. Um, I did competitive martial arts. I did bodybuilding. I was in really good shape. Then I went to this guy. I felt like just that I was just a nothing wrong with being a nerd, but I just felt like a nerd who wasn't physically active. Um, I wasn't happy mentally or physically. And I looked down at my body and I look in the mirror and I, I didn't recognize who I was. Mm -hmm. And so that year took a big toll on me. And getting to that point, that was my lowest point. I think uh, I realized then that getting in the gym and, and doing like lifting weights or even doing 20 minutes of cardio, it's so much more than just, you know, I'm, I'm doing this fun thing or I'm trying to get jacked. There's so much mental building that you do while you go to the gym. There's stress relief. There's the ability to forget whatever problems you're going through in your life at that moment. Um, and I'd forgotten all about that. And really, when everything came back to me was when I started going back to the gym. And if you and that was the longest break. Yeah, yeah, if you think about it, during that time period, there's there's two things that you could have definitely done. You could have definitely found time to get in a little bit of exercise. Maybe it wouldn't look like the same thing you're doing now. Maybe it wouldn't be this uh, enormous amount of like lifting and cardio and all these things. But a few 10 minute walks would probably have been something that would have been very manageable. And then also the understanding of, OK, I'm not training as much. So I need to figure out a way to restrict calories a little bit. I need to figure out a way to eat a little bit differently. You know, now that you have that knowledge, that same situation will never happen to you again, because at the very least, you'll at least be holding on to like one or two things. Maybe you're only doing some cardio and maybe you're only practicing uh, some of the diet techniques and stuff like that. But that's really important for people to understand. It's like, man, just hold on to something with with all this that we share, because my dad right now has lost about 30 or 40 pounds. Um, yeah, I saw that. And, it's a very impressive. Yeah, and it's mainly been through exercise. Now, my and, and he is paying attention to his food, but um, until more recently, like he hasn't really been on point with his food either. But my mom hasn't really done anything with exercise and always been dieting. And she's lost uh, 60 pounds. So just that, like I'm saying is just try to, you, you need both, in my opinion, to be as healthy as possible. Um, but man, just try to hold on to one one of those ideas, you know, either diet or exercise. Hopefully you can work it out to where you can do both. Um, but it, it can it's going to lead to a better lifestyle. It's going to lead to a healthier lifestyle, even if you're just able to hold on to just one of those things. Yeah, I totally agree. And first of all, I have to applaud your parents for making that change because I know especially later on in life, it becomes harder and harder. Uh, your belief system fades. And if you're at a certain stage when you're 40 or 50, you almost convince yourself that there's nothing more you can do. And this is your permanent state till, you know, till the day you, you go. So I've seen that mentality a lot. People who get to their 40s and 50s and um, it, it's a hard thing to break. Uh, I totally get it. It's like anything else. You, once you build that habit for so long, uh, it's just tough. And, and the fact that they were able to make that change is awesome. Um, I'll be, 42. yeah, for me, I'll be 42 yeah. next month. And, uh, you know, before I did this bodybuilding show, I actually kind of thought that was it for me in some way. I didn't think like, uh, you know, I, I, I once, once I started to lose some weight, I was like, man, like my arms are going to look like crap. My chest is going to look weird because I torn pecs and different things. But I was able to change a lot of stuff as I was going through the process, and I was able to actually develop some pretty good pecs and develop a pretty good back. And, I, and when it came down to the end, I was really, I really shocked myself. I was like, shit, like, all right, well, that, you know, I could certainly be better. Anybody could be better. But I, I was like, wow, like I was able to actually make some really good, positive, strong changes. So even myself, who's been in all this for a long time, I kind of counted myself out in a way. I was like, I don't know what this is going to look like when I diet down, but. This is what I committed to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's important for everyone to know is even a guy who is so experienced and has been around the health and fitness industry for so long, like yourself, will eventually have those thoughts. I mean, it's really normal. Uh, there's nothing superhuman about you or your abilities. It's all from the mental state and, uh, and in your ability to believe that you can achieve something and then put in the work to get there. Uh, I don't think that anyone is really talented. I don't really think that anyone has this special gift, whether you're talking about business are you talking about fitness are you talking about someone who's an elite level in their sport i really just think it, it comes down to your your willingness to stick to a goal um really no matter how hard it seems at the beginning so that belief system is all you need to really start right yeah um so for me when i lost all that weight 
Um, it was because I had learned about a ketogenic diet through one of my courses. At the time, I was doing a lot of biology stuff. And that was actually the way that I got back into the gym is because I started eating. And, um, you know, I noticed that little bit of weight come off really quickly. Uh, obviously, a little bit of it was water weight, but it's a really good feeling to see something move in a positive direction. I think people are quick to criticize low carb diets like keto because they, you know, they say, oh, it's all water weight, but no, it's just a little bit of water weight that your body's holding on from having an excessive amount of carbohydrates stored. And for most people, it's one step, you know, it's that first thing of seeing that scale go down and they go, wow, like this feels really good. I haven't seen this happen in years or months or whatever it may be. So I started dabbling into the ketogenic diet within the first week. I started going back to the gym and it just kind of all built momentum on another I started seeing results in the gym. It made me dial in my nutrition more, dialing in my nutrition more, it made me more committed to going to the gym. Uh, and then the rest was history. And so that's what kind of landed me into getting more and more involved in this community and trying to help as many people as possible see that route because it's just one tool, right? I'm not, I would never say that the ketogenic diet is the perfect way of eating, um, but it's one way that works for people. And at the end of the day, diet and exercise is a tool, no matter how you use it, whether you like yoga, you like going for a bike ride, you like paleo or you like keto, the best diet and the best exercise is the one that you enjoy and that's going to work for you at the end of the day. Um, and I know you're big on the war on carbs, so I want to know how did that start and uh, and kind of what your experience was with it. I know I've been following your Instagram yeah. for a while, but uh, maybe if anybody's listening who doesn't know about your war on carbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I started a lower carbohydrate uh, eating um, in like the mid 90s and toyed around with it for a long time. Uh, I did the body opus diet by Dan Duchesne. I did the metabolic diet by Dr. Mauro De Pasquale. I followed the Atkins diet. I followed a lot of, you know, keto style diets. And what I found personally, and also, you know, uh, in helping other people is I found kind of this sweet spot with the keto diet to where you don't necessarily have to be keto in order to get a lot of the results. And I started to learn that Okay, it does seem like there's a little bit of room for some carbohydrates once people kind of get, you know, quote unquote, fat adapted, once people get used to the diet and once they, you know, kind of understand that if they are going to start to consume some carbohydrates, those carbohydrates can be extremely dangerous because they can trigger them into eating, you know, uh, into, into falling into a trap of just eating more junk food and more carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are not the enemy. Carbohydrates are just fine, just like any other macronutrient, but they're very easy to overindulge up, upon. And then we get the mixture of, of carbohydrates and fats is when we really start to get in trouble. And actually, there's a lot of just misinformation uh, on a lot of these topics. People will, you know, like I say war on carbs and I might show a picture of like a donut. But that's very misleading because the donut actually has a lot more fat calories in it than it does carb carbohydrate calories. Um, you know, so it, all these things are very interesting and like keto can sometimes be misleading because really what most people are referring to is a lower carbohydrate uh, lifestyle. Um, even though I've been eating keto for a few days, I actually texted my ketones this morning, which I don't really normally do, but I like to poke around every once in a while and check it out. I was a 0.4, so like clinically... Uh, my ketone millimolars aren't, you know, adding up to be uh, that I'm in you know, clinical keto ketosis, right? But who really gives a crap about all that stuff? Let's just talk about the raw bare bones of like, let's figure out ways to help people so they can lose weight. So they don't have to be confused. You don't have to bleed. You don't have to pee on stuff. Um, let's just keep it really simple. And the simplest thing is to say, look, man, ditch all those nasty carbohydrates, get rid of them. You know, get rid of these carbohydrates. And the reason why you get rid of them is because you want to overindulge on them because they're, they're normally highly, proce in proce highly processed foods that we're eating. You know, go through somebody's pantry or somebody's, you know, cupboard at their house and you'll see all these snacks. Well, it, it's not usually just uh, beef jerky uh, that doesn't have any sugar in it. You know, it's, it's, it's almost always uh, you got chips and you have um, – candy and you have cereal and you just have these very carbohydrate dense, maybe some cookies and things like that. Very carbohydrate dense meals, right? Or not, they're not even meals. And that actually ends up being the biggest problem. Um, but the carbohydrates are just the things that are easy to kind of munch on. I mean, I, come on, I think we all know like what's bad, right? It's very hard to figure out 
how we can agree on what's good because you got, you know, somebody will argue that, uh, you know, spinach isn't great for you because it has X, Y, and Z in it. And then someone else will say it's great for you. Somebody else will say the carnivore diet's great and here's why. And it's got, you know, it's most, you know, nutrient dense. And it's like, wow, this gets to be really complicated. But let's all collectively pull our heads out of our ass and let's all just, Let's, let's just all agree that we can understand what, what foods are bad for us and, and what that means. When I say bad, I don't mean like you're going to die from it, but bad being that it's not going to help anyone uh, in terms of their weight loss goals. Um, and it certainly won't help with their weight loss goals in terms of them eating it all the time. You know, and someone can make an argument and say, oh, well, it'd be, you know, it's OK to have a piece of cake here and there. And that might actually fuel your weight loss. And that that can be true. Uh, there's definitely, you know, some reward system stuff, and there's definitely some things you can do to to build into all this. But again, let's let's simplify this. Let's make it easy. Uh, a ketogenic diet, in my opinion, is the best way for people that have struggled with their diet to follow a plan that allows them to control the overall caloric intake. Um, I'm not really big on like calorie in calorie out. And the reason why I say that is because I don't think it's such a direct calculation that you can just say this thousand calories means this, um, things that are packaged and that have their calorie content written on them can be off by like 50%, five, zero percent. Um, that's, that's a huge discrepancy. I also think that our body, um, will read the caloric, the calories for the day slightly differently from one day to the next. And I also would believe that, um, if, uh, if you have a different carbohydrate sensitivity than I do, then it also seems to make sense that you have a different caloric sensitivity than I do. Maybe even the types of foods that you ingest are getting di uh, digested differently than me. But again, let's all just go back to this principle of like, okay, forget all that. We, we kind of understand that there's going to be some major differences between us all. And yes, there can be some variance in calories. So let's give it some, uh, let's let it fluctuate a little bit here and there. And let's just say, give it a 10% padding, you know, um, people can track and they can write things down, but, um, y you don't have to spend your time there. In my opinion, um, what you're working towards, you're working towards being healthier and what are some, what are some easy ways to be healthier, easier way to be healthier is to start to move more. An easier way to start to be healthier is to control the things that are problematic for you. What's problematic for you? Hunger, cravings. Okay, let's start with hunger. Let's have you eat more often. Let's have you eat about four times a day or five times a day. That may not be the healthiest thing to do all the time to eat four or five times a day or six times a day, but it's a great option to start to get rid of what some of that hunger starts to feel like you have some real severe cravings. Okay. Well, what time do they happen? Okay. They happen at 7 PM. Your last meal of the day is at 7 PM and you, it still has to be something nutritious. It still has to line up with, uh, or what you're, what you're supposed to be eating. Or let's just say even your last meal is at five, shut it down at five and go to bed at eight. You know, you got three, now you have a three hour window where you're not eating any food, which might kind of drive you crazy, but guess what? most likely that this is my, in my experience, most likely you'll probably sleep better. So what I like to do with people is have addition by subtraction. And this war on carbs starts to get very, very easy and not very complicated at all and not hard to do. We're basically looking at meat based products. So if you're vegan, it would be really hard to follow the war on carbs. Um, you got uh, steak, you got chicken, you got pork. Steak is my favorite. That's my choice. Eggs, cheese, and then you can have some dairy, but it gets to be hard because there's usually sugars in those. I personally will have some, um, I personally will have some, uh, small amounts of yogurt. Just, I like the probiotics and, uh, just like the way they taste. So sometimes that's a little snack for me type thing. Um, but once you start to implement some of these things, okay, now I'm going to eat four times a day. I'm going to walk twice every day. Great way to start your day and a great way to end your day is with a 10 minute walk. 10 minute walk, uh, maybe first thing in the morning or after breakfast and a 10 minute walk after your, your last meal at night has been shown to help with digestion, help control glucose levels. Um, in addition to that, we are going to cut off our food a few hours before we go to bed. So I said four meals, right? 
Uh, I said, let's cut it off a few hours before bed. Let's walk. Let's get in more. Let's drink more water. Let's keep hydrated. These are all very simple things to do. What vegetables do you like? Start eating those. How many vegetables? I don't know. Four or five. Like, eat them till your heart's content. Make your foods taste good. Don't really worry too much about, you know, throwing red hot sauce on there and stuff like that. In the beginning, do what you need to do to, to get yourself through it, uh, to, to get yourself to actually be on the diet. If you need to make a fathead pizza and you know, need to go to rule.me and look up a lot of these recipes for keto cookies and these different things, do what you need to do to get yourself through it at first and then have the understanding of, hey, look, you know what? I need to probably cut back on some of this stuff too because it's very easy to overindulge because these things taste way too damn good as well. But the main thing for me is I just love, love to teach people, look, man, keep adding to your day, adding to your day, adding to your day. And by the time I added so much to your day, you have so much on your plate that you there's no room for you to mess anything up. Yeah, I totally agree. In terms of, um, you know, the dangers of sugar itself, um, they're probably worse for you than cigarettes, I would argue, based on the research that I've seen. You don't see any warning labels on candy, right? I mean, anything that has to do with food, yeah, it's actually typically... Than, it's actually worse than that. On, yeah. On, on like cereal boxes, you'll see a heart on there. And then you turn yep. the thing around and it's got like more than 13 grams of sugar per serving you like why is this considered heart healthy like who who made that decision this is ridiculous <laughs> yeah no it's horrible and uh if you look at the the leading cause of death especially in men being heart to heart disease being one of them you know you start to think about it, it it's it comes from a diet right like you don't uh, unless it's genetic in which case those cases are quite rare <clears throat> a lot of people are dying from obesity they're dying from overweight and they're dying from overweight related causes i mean food and obesity is really one of the biggest preventable causes of death in North America. And it's so gluttonous because it's something that's just supposed to fuel your body for survival at the, at the foundational level. If you look at, uh, <clears throat> food itself, and then you go back to the, the carb addiction, right? For a lot of people, they build bad relationships with food for whatever reason, whether they turn to it for stress through hard times, uh, maybe they're emotional eaters, but quite frankly, sugar tastes amazing. You know, you can't argue that a donut doesn't taste good. You can't argue that a, a bowl of Nesquik cereal doesn't taste good. What you can argue is the harm in including that in your diet if you're not someone who can manage to have appropriate amounts of carbohydrates. So you said something really important. Carbs are not the enemy. And I totally agree. You just have to have, I think, the self-awareness to say, okay, am I managing to eat carbohydrates in a responsible manner that feels my performance, my daily lifestyle, or my sport, whatever it may be? Or is it taking a control of me where I'm letting it direct my life? It's a response to emotion, and I treat it like a drug. And I think that's the biggest thing is, do you have it behind closed doors when other people aren't watching and you're telling everyone that you're on a diet? Are you doing it out in public places where you know, you know that you're supposed to be sticking to a certain plan? Has your doctor advised you to stay away from it, and now you're still having it? At the end of the day, basic sugar turns into a drug for a lot of people. Now, you can make the same argument for alcohol, right? A lot of people enjoy a beer every now and then. It's a part of their lifestyle. It's a social thing. They'll enjoy a glass of wine, but then there are people that will abuse drinking beer and then they'll get into fights or whatever it may be. But right. at the end of the day, it's it's not the enemy. You can't blame a donut for killing someone. You can't blame a donut for making someone obese, but you can look at those sources of it and how people can break out of that carb addiction cycle. And there, there's so many good resources for it that... All you have to do is start, you know, you, you will figure a way to to work on it as long as you're committed to starting. That first step is so important with something like keto. And so I, I finished my master's degree. I started the ketogenic diet and I looked at how it affected obesity and breast cancer. We literally treated breast cancer cells in two conditions. One, we looked at a ketogenic environment of low sugar, low insulin and moderate levels of ketones. We looked at the entire range from anywhere from zero to 14 millimolar. Even we looked at the the higher side of things um, and we compared it to a high sugar, high insulin environment, which is uh, typical of either cell culture or, or just a, a Western diet in general. Um, we found that a lot of the growth factors were slowed down in the absence of sugar, but that the ketones were basically just arbitrary. And I mean that in people are worried about ketosis. They, they get stuck on this word they get stuck on the levels. They want to pee on sticks. They want to stab themselves. They think that getting a high level of ketones is a good thing. 
And it can be in some situations, but really ketones are arbitrary. The point is you're removing sugar from the diet or you're removing refined carbs. And now there's an alternate fuel source that comes from fat. And really, if anyone's listening, they're worried about ketosis or what it means. Basically, it's something you don't even have to worry about. Like Mark said, just stick to whatever diet it is. If it's the removal of carbs, if it's the presence of healthy fats and getting stuck on those details and going on Instagram and arguing with vegans and carnivore diets and people who do keto and people who are on paleo is not going to help any of this. It's taking away attention from what the culprit is. And that's basic, basic refined processed sugar that shows up in way too many foods at the end of the day. And the last thing about, you know, the, the war on carbs or keto, whatever you want to call it, is there's a really important uh, peptide called neuropeptide Y, and that's actually activated in the brain in response to fattier diets. And it's one of the things that helps to control your hunger. So I found anecdotally and from people who have done keto, and you can talk to anyone who's really experienced a ketogenic diet. I don't know if you agree, but it helps keep you full, right? One of the biggest benefits of eating meat or fattier cuts of food, whether it's salmon or steak or, or ground beef or eggs, is that it really helps keep your stomach and your brain full. What I mean by that is if you have six eggs for breakfast, there's no way that you're going to have another six eggs for breakfast right after that, unless you're a bodybuilder or there's some need for you to have a dozen eggs for breakfast. Same goes for lunch. If you have a 12 ounce steak or two five ounce beef patties, I guarantee there's no chance you're going to stuff your face with another 12 ounce steak. It's just impossible. Your brain and your, your body, especially your stomach will signal things back to your brain that say, Hey, listen, I'm full. I'm satisfied. and I don't need any more food. When it comes to a bag of chips, when it comes to a cheesecake, like there's no argument. You don't have to look at a scientific paper to say, when I have a piece of cake, I'm going to have another one. There's there's a 99% chance that you have a piece of cake. There's room in your belly and your brain for another piece of cake. So it's important to have the same common enemy, which at the end of the day is refined sugar. Yeah, and these um, you know things that you're going to overindulge on and eat more of, they just taste so good that it's going to kind of override your decision-making skills. Um you can almost look at your decision-making skills getting um, – you want your decision-making skills to be really strong. So with the removal of carbohydrates, you're adding a lot of control into your life. Um, once you break that barrier and you have that tortilla chip, uh, odds of you continuing on the path of eating more tortilla chips is very high. And the odds of those tortilla chips turning into cookies is also very high you're probably going to kind of continue down that path for the rest of that night and maybe end your night, cap your night off with some ice cream or something like that because you now have kind of lost control. And the same thing happens. You make bad decisions. We make bad choices. Uh, when we drink, you might end up in fights. You might end up hooking up with a girl who's not as cute as you originally thought, right? All these things are definitely uh, – you make a bad decision to drive your car. Um, you make these really bad uh, choices. And that kind of leads me into also you have to really make sure that you're getting in enough sleep, getting in enough rest. And there's a lot of entrepreneurs and people sharing this message of, hey, let's wake up at four o'clock. And, um, you know, I, I talk about that often. I talk about getting out in front of the day, but I also share the message of like, you know, seven o'clock rolls around at night. I'm starting to think about like, okay, when am I going to get to bed? And I try to get to bed somewhere between like eight and nine. It happens on most nights, doesn't happen every night, but I also don't wake up at 4 a.m. every single day. Uh, most days I do for today, for example, I woke up at like 6.30. I made myself go back to bed. I'm like, I, there's absolutely no, we've trained really hard the last couple of days. We had a kind of long weekend. We ran a power theme meet. Like there's absolutely no reason for me to be awake. There's no reason for me to be hungry to try to get ahead of today. When I wake up, I'll still have plenty of time to get out in front of the day and I'll still have a great successful day. So it's all, it's all this rational thought that you have to kind of wrap around your day and wrap around your food. And yeah, what is it, what does it all look like? Um, it, you know, would it be possible if, if for some reason we were all forced into only eating a hundred carbs a day, um, it would be my belief that a lot of people would lose weight because they would just have more control over their diet over a period of time. Your point, um, about fats, you know, it, there's, fat and protein, protein especially can be satiating. Um, carbohydrates can be too in some way because just because of the, um, like, uh, rice, you know, you eat rice and then it, it will fill you up for the moment because it will take up space. 
but it will kind of digest fairly quickly as well. And then you'll be kind of, you'll, hu- you'll be hungry again where a steak or some red meat or something is going to take, it's going to take a long time to break all that down. But on top of that, it's like, yes, yeah, steak tastes great, but you're not like dying for it. You know, it's not, it's not the same thing as when something's sweet, you just find yourself to where you just turn into like a bear and you're like, out of, you're out of control. But the biggest mistake that people can make is when you start to ingest some of this junk food, it doesn't leave any room for you to bring in the things that are healthy for you. It's almost like when somebody's an addict, you know, and, and they're, they're really struggling with, with drugs or alcohol. And it's like everyone else's life is progressing. A lot of your friends are moving forward. And not only are you in the same spot, but you're actually literally moving backwards. Because when you're in that kind of state and you're in that kind of shape, um, you you cannot really – you can't think about getting ahead because you're kind of thinking about surviving. You're thinking about how you're going to survive each and every day. And a lot of people who are out of shape, a lot of people who are fat and upset and depressed and pissed off that they're fat, but they're not really doing anything about it because they're not 100% sure on how to go about doing it. They know that the change uh, – the, the pain of change is going to hurt really bad. Um, you need to also understand that the, the, the pain of staying the same is, is way worse. You know, there's that saying, look, if you duck, it's going to hurt anyway. So you may as well, you know, get on board with this idea of how do I, how do I make progress? How do I stop being a little bitch about it? Like you're going to just cry like the people on biggest loser. Cause you're fat. No, you made yourself this heavy. It's time that you do something about it and you don't need to cry about it. I understand there's emotions attached to it because you're ashamed that you allowed yourself to get uh, that far out of shape. But no, no one really cares that much. No one. Yes, people will be cruel and people will say mean and rude things. But the second that you tell people that you're on this new mission and you're on this new path, they're going to go, amen to that. That sounds awesome. I'm so proud of you. That's great. And you'll say, oh, man, I, you know, I've lost 20 pounds. I want to lose another 20. They're like, that is fantastic. Obviously, you're always going to have this, some negativity coming at you in some way. But most people will be supportive. And most people will say, hey, you know what? Let me know how I can help. If there's a way I can help. And then that way, when that person who's on the diet, they come over to your house for uh, a particular occasion, you might be like, hey, man, I made some meat and veggies. I know that you're on a diet, right? Like most people are going to be – they're going to be excited about it. Like, dude, I've been kind of waiting for you to do that. You know, I don't want to see you unhealthy. I don't want to see you walking around like that. So it's important, too, to share with people that this is what you're going to do. This is you, – you made your decision, and, and you're going to make some big changes in your life. Yeah, and I, I tell people who come to me and they say that their concern is – Either, you know, they might get made fun of or that they don't have supportive family or friends or that they'll go into certain social circumstances where people will put them down. Maybe they've tried other diets in the past, but like go prove them wrong. You have this opportunity to really shine and prove yourself as a person. And what you said about losing that first 10 or 20 pounds, people's mentalities will shift. You really need to be in the position to prove them wrong for them to start giving that respect that you think that you deserve. But it doesn't come easy. And it is not always easy. People might make fun of you. Oh, you're on this new keto diet, right? Like I've heard all the chirps before and, and, you know, I didn't have to deal with a ton of it, but I know a lot of people will come to me and say like, how do I do it? You know, my friends, my family, but someone says to you, oh, you're on that diet or you're on paleo, you're on keto. You just turn to them and say, yeah, I am. And what about it? The more attention that you give it, the more you feel it, the more excuses you try to come up with why this is a good diet and why other people should try it. Like literally just do your thing and prove them wrong. At the end of the day, if you're on the right track, like you're going to win and people are going to realize that. And that's really all you need to do. There's no yeah. convincing other people what you're doing is right at the end of the day. Well, if you, if you explain to them too, that, uh, you know, what you're doing is allowing you to regain control over your entire life. It's, that's a hard, that's a hard thing to deal. That's a hard thing for someone to try to deny. That's a hard thing for someone to be a jerk about. It's like, no, man, like this is helping my relationship. This is helping my uh, ability to take care of my kids. This is affecting everything in a positive way. I'm flying around a business. It looks like I'm going to get a raise. You know, I mean, this this kind of stuff is some really strong, impactful stuff that is uh, undeniable. The keto diet is not a fad diet. It's been around for quite some time. 
bodybuilders have been utilizing forms of it for a long time. Um, it's just that there's more information about it now. There's more people uh, putting out books about it. There's more podcasts about it. There's just more information floating around about it because there's a lot of interest in it. Uh, people are searching the word. People are looking it up. So there's been a lot of products created around uh, ketosis, around the ketogenic diet. And most of the people I talk to are are a lot like yourself um, where – you're not going to find too many people that are like, dude, it's all about producing ketones, you know, um, because I think most of us realize that that's not really the game. That's not even the battle. That's not the fight. That's not the war. The war is on carbs. And that's that's why I wrote the book. It's my book's right here. The war on carbs. Bob boom. Um, and it's because that's the fight. The fight is against uh, refined foods that taste awesome, that none of us can really figure out a way to control or maintain. But if you explain that to somebody who, who's trying to give you some heat for, Oh man, you're on that keto diet. Oh, it's just a trend. And you can say, actually, you know, that, that might be true. It might be a trend, but it, I, I'm finding it to be really effective for me. And what it's done is by removing the carbohydrates, it's given me a lot of control over the foods I'm eating. And now I'm eating meat and I'm eating vegetables and I just, I feel better. I have better focus. I'm I'm, uh, just everything's better all the way from me taking a dump all the way to, uh, me being able to, uh, you know, play some basketball with my kids. Like everything, uh, will improve. Now that's not to say that everything can improve on another diet. I want to make that clear too. I've tried a lot of other diets and they've all worked well for me. Um, I do in the bodybuilding show, I, I didn't utilize a ketogenic diet for that. And the reason is, is that carbohydrates, they hydrate the muscles. They, they make the muscle cells bigger and fuller. And so in order to keep up with the demand of what I was doing, which was multiple workouts a day, three workouts a day towards the end, 90 minutes of cardio training every single day, along with about an hour of lifting, uh, it was brutal. And it was just a high, high energy output. I could have done that on a ketogenic diet, but I probably most likely would have withered away and probably only, only weighed you know, 205 pounds or 210 pounds rather than 235 pounds, which I was, um, which I was on stage. But I always go back to the ketogenic diet. And right now I'm back on it again. Um, I like to utilize it to kind of clear things out. Uh, I like to use it for, uh, some of the health benefits of it. I just love fat. Like personally, I love cheese. I love bacon. I love whole eggs. I, I love all that stuff. And, the bodybuilding diet, I still didn't eat that many carbs either. I still was only at about 150 carbs a day, which is not a lot. But a little bit of carbohydrates can go a long way. For So for some of your listeners that are like, man, I just, you know, I want to get bigger. I want to recomp. And, I, you know, you want to try to change your body composition and things like that. You can specifically target certain muscles and you can uh, have small doses of carbohydrates on those days and kind of refill. So like if you... Let's say you train chest for the day and you're just not happy with the way your chest development looks on that particular day. When you're done with your training session, you can have some carbohydrates, maybe start out with just like 50 grams and kind of see what that does for you. You can have it in the form of a regular post-workout shake, or you can go a different route and just have it through food. Either way, you can go 25 or 30 grams before and after training if you wanted to, and you can still be on this low, low carbohydrate lifestyle diet that will still yield great results. And it may even yield better results than you've seen before because you're able to recover from those workouts. You're able to support the workout that you're doing. The key is if you're going to add any carbohydrates in is that they, A, don't trigger, trigger anything on you because most of us are too, too much of a fat kid to be able to control those triggers. And the other thing is it's just enough to fuel what you're doing but it's not excess and beyond anything uh, above and beyond that. So it's just literally fueling that that one workout that you did. And um, you don't even have to necessarily do that every day. But if you want to bring up a weak body part, uh, that's kind of a good way of doing it. And if you wanted to do it, you know, uh, three or four times a week, it probably wouldn't hurt you either. Th those are strategies I've used over the years, and they've uh, been extremely beneficial to me. And I realized that, no, it's not keto because you're eating, you know, you're, you're having an influx of carbohydrates, but, um, you can even look at, uh, uh, the, the, the bulletproof, uh, bulletproof diet. 
thumb through there. He's got a list of some low glycemic uh, carbohydrates and fruits and stuff that he eats, blackberries and some different things and sweet potatoes. And you, you can still add in some carbohydrates just because you're on this low carb kick or on a keto diet does not mean that you have to always be at zero. Yeah, exactly. For me, um, there's so many options to keto itself and outside of keto that uh, they're all tools, right? So whether you're doing a total ketogenic diet, whether you're doing a cyclic ketogenic diet, and really what those terms mean is where are you putting in your carbs and what are your goals? So if you're doing a ketogenic diet, but you're focusing on performance and strength, then you will time carbohydrate intake to, you know, tailor your goals. And so, um, you know, we have people that work with our program and they will specify that, hey, listen, uh, I'm doing CrossFit and my main goal is to get stronger. My second goal is to lose weight. So then there's a shift in that priority. There's a shift in the carbohydrate intake. And so you'll target certain carbohydrates. So if you really every day want to put in the best performance possible, then we'll put in a little bit of white rice or some fruit before your workout. Because I'm a big believer in keto and what it can do. And studies have shown that it can maintain or improve strength. But really, if you want to get stronger, bigger, you're going to need some carbohydrates. You're going to need to feel the IGF pathway. And so in the summertime, I, I tore my meniscus playing hockey. Oh. And that was a brutal injury for me. Yeah, it was it was tough. I mean, it was only a partial tear, but still it was to the point where I couldn't walk on it for a couple of weeks. And I'd never hurt my knee before. So that was a big concern Did you have for a me. I walked or into the doctor. Or just healed up? It just healed up. So I went to the doctor's office and uh, he looked at me and, you know, doctors are typically blunt with injuries. And he said, you're never going to squat again. And I recommend that you don't play hockey ever again. God, and I'm a 26 year old does, guy. Right? Like, say I, that to you, you know? oh, man, it was uh, it was a big blow. And at first I took it personally and I was upset. And I and then I decided, well, I'm going to consult a second, third opinion. And so I talked to my athletic therapist that works out of our gym, uh, our office is actually at a CrossFit gym here, CrossFit Solid Ground. Oh, cool. And so, yeah, he, he looked at uh, my knee, took me through some tests, and he's like, you know, first of all, I don't think you need surgery. Second of all, if you can do all this, I think you're okay. And so that was the beginning of uh, getting back to exercise for me. I was able to start squatting again. And then I said, you know what? My goals right now are to keep inflammation down, so I'll remove refined carbs. But I want to get stronger, and I want to get stronger quickly. So I started having a more paleo approach. So it's basically I'm still eating a ketogenic diet, but I had some gluten-free oatmeal for breakfast and some white rice before my workouts. Right. And really, that was it. I still told myself that, hey, you're still going to be as strict as you were before because you don't want to flare up. You know, my elbows get really bad if I eat too much sugar. And, uh, and it worked really well for me. I got very strong very quickly. I was back up to squatting 365 for, you know, to pause reps after – maybe six weeks of my injury. Nice. Um, I got back to my deadlift. I think I hit almost 500 pounds just within the two months coming back. And that was huge for me because I went from not exercising and thinking that I was done to almost right back where I was within two or three months. And that was huge. And again, that goes back to just having the right tools, right? So I have this little toolbox of nutrition and exercise and I pick things out when I need them. Life is not this constant <laughs> stream of, uh, you know, every day is the same. Right. You're never injured. You sleep well every day. You're always the same weight. Like things are going to happen. I was actually really You're going to have circumstances. how well I, I was able to, to handle uh, oatmeal. I, I love and I actually really enjoy it quite a bit. I, I'm a little bit weird, I would say. Like I like kind of the plain flavors of you know, things like almonds and, and even spinach. Like I could just eat spinach like by itself. And I, I somehow, uh, enjoy, I somehow enjoy, uh, some of the flavors that foods naturally have. But, um, yeah, I was really kind of shocked that, uh, uh, you know, when, when I went on the bodybuilding diet, I was like oatmeal. I'm like, you know, the, the guy that was helping me through it and stuff, he advised me to eat that every morning. And I was like, I'm not going to eat oatmeal. I'm probably going to kill my stomach. I'm probably gonna have a lot of gas and my it didn't do it. It actually felt great. And it was, uh, you know, slow digesting and it gave me plenty of fuel to, uh, to get through my workouts. And, and it's, it has a lot of fiber in it as well. So really the carbohydrates and oatmeal is really just, it's not that high. It's, uh, if you have like half a cup of oatmeal, I mean, you're probably looking at about 20 grams of usable carbohydrates. It's a real drop in the bucket. Um, if you're somebody that's, that's training hard and, and getting after it, that's, that's not a lot of carbohydrates. Yeah, it really isn't. And um, again, those are just small tools for you based on, you know, the goals that you are. And for anyone listening, um, 
the two things that you can really do to assess whether or not carbs might be right for you. One is look at your physical activity levels, right? Are you exercising more than an hour a day? That's typically my my like go to reference is like, are you putting in more than an hour of intense exercise where you're depleting the glycogen in your muscles and you're demanding that that carbohydrate intake for your muscles to be able to use, right? Because essentially you want to you want to trickle feed your muscles where they're only using the carbohydrates that you need. Otherwise, anything excess is getting stored into fat. Right. And the second would be carbohydrate uh, tolerance. And you, you talked about this uh, a little bit earlier, but basically everyone's different, right? Based on the day of the week, uh, you know, if you've had enough sleep, enough water, your body's going to respond differently to calories and macronutrients. And then there's the variability in human to human. Every human tolerates carbohydrates in a different manner, whether you're exercising or not. And you see a lot of people who have high carbohydrate diets and they don't have a problem. You know, they exercise a little bit here and there, but they're good. Like they're healthy. They're not overweight. Um, But I find that for the most part, uh, generally speaking, the population is intolerant to a higher carb diet so those are the two basically the two tests to see like well are carbohydrates right for me can they have a role in you know my diet based on my exercise goals and really comes down to intensity of sport i find that hockey players soccer players um those types of sports where you're you're tapping into the anaerobic uh glycogen it's typically important um that's why there are not a ton of hockey players that are on keto diets uh, if it was amazing for them they probably would be on it by now maybe off-season. but then you see like you know maybe off season might not be exactly like, drop a couple pounds get a little lighter but yeah you're right like why why make your job harder like you're trying to be more efficient and you're trying to do better and so um these athletes can implement um man 100 grams of carbs can go a really long way or 200 grams of carbs and that's you know that's probably where I mean, some of them are leaner than others. So if you're already really lean, then you can kind of throw almost all this advice out the window. But uh, for the most part, trying to even stay healthy and to try to stay lean, um, you know, you you still want to kind of, you know, just uh, manage those carbohydrates in some way or utilize them as you're saying, like use it as a tool, like bring it out when it counts, you know? Yeah. And so you see guys like Zach Bitter, and he was on our podcast talking about his diet. And so he, he does have some carbohydrates throughout the year. And it's basically based on how he's feeling. You know, he knows some days that his body just needs that little bit of extra juice. And he's doing a longer endurance type sport. So he can get away with being a fat adapted athlete. I've been, I've been doing this for a long, for a long time. I've been doing this for a long time. And, and I've had, you know, a lot of success. My, my friend and I, Jesse Burdick, um, we've been doing this, you know, keto style diet for a really long time. And I, it's been it's been so much fun for me to watch all this information get unpacked and all these people share this information. Uh, you got scientists and these these high level doctors and me and my buddy are sitting back, you know, like elbowing each other, you know, like saying, dude, like we're geniuses. Like, look at this, all this information coming out that you can still be on this low carb diet and still eat some carbohydrates because he and I, uh, you know, in 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 the kind of prime of my powerlifting career. Uh, that's what I did is I still had a high fat, um, moderate protein. Um, and then I used carbohydrates sparingly kind of when I needed to, uh, to perform well. And it, it's always worked great for me. And I think people are in such shock when they kind of hear that, but, you know, first of all, understand that you need to go through the process of, of ketosis first and that it is somewhat important to kind of rev up those ketones in the beginning. So that way, you know, make sure you're in ketosis, make sure you've done it for a while, make, do it without the carbohydrates for a while. You're not going to die. I can tell you, you're not going to die. Uh, do it without the carbohydrates for a little while. Be really strict, be really steady on it. But once you get into it, and once you've been doing it for a month or two months and you're starting to feel like you get the hang of it, and you want your performance to pick back up in the gym, that's when you add the carbs back in. You want to be a little bit bigger, a little stronger. Uh, that's when you can bring it back in. Something I want to, wanted to bring up, too, before you go on is uh, you mentioned being hurt. And uh, two things on that. Number one is, you know, your doctor, a lot of times when they do like an X-ray or MRI, they don't have previous work to go off of. And uh, so it's it's frustrating to me that, with somebody who's 26 years old, that they would be so blunt that way. Like that's just too, 
yes, they should caution you about the dangers of you getting, you know, back into hockey or you getting back into some of these things that could potentially be dangerous for you. They could say, Hey, you know what? That's probably like a year or two off. Like if I'm, if I'm going to be honest with you, cause you got to rebuild this thing, but you know, hopefully, hopefully in a year or two, you'll be back and you'll be, hopefully you'll be back to normal, but they shouldn't be like crushing your dreams like that. But what I always look at with that is like, man, they don't have anything to compare that to. So the odds of your knee being jacked up before you ever even had the actual injury are probably pretty high because you've probably always been pretty physical. You probably always competed in something. And so even like, let's just say it's your right knee. If they did a, a, an MRI and x-ray of your left knee, it probably looks like shit too, because that's we're athletes and we beat the crap out of ourselves. So if you're somebody listening to this and you, you have gotten advice from a doctor, don't, don't let that, uh, scare the, scare the crap out of you. They are doctors. They do know a lot of what they're talking about. And so, uh, you should at least have heard what they said, but at the same time, great, great observation by yourself to go to another, another person. I mean, this is how people get depressed. This is how people get hooked on painkillers. This leads to some really brutal, bad things for people. So be really cautious of that. Another note when you're hurt, and also kind of in the same uh, context of, of being depressed, when you get hurt, it, it can be devastating. It can be so devastating because this training, you know, this is going to sound like the total meathead comment of the year, but this training means so much to us. It means everything to us. Um, it's not just lifting weights. It's, I talked about it earlier. So you're built, you're building, you're building up your body, but you're really, you're building up your mind and you're building up character and you're building up strength so you can take on other things in your life, take on resistance in your life. But what a great opportunity it is when you're hurt to say, you know what? Okay. I'm banged up. There's a lot of things that I can't do, but let's, let me refocus. And what are some things that I can do? What's something I can, again, hold on to. Okay. Well, man, like I can't squat, can't deadlift. My knees banged up. Can't really walk. Can't go on a treadmill. Can't go on a bike. Can't go on an elliptical. You're like, man, I, they're okay. Shit. And I guess some of the stuff at the gym is out of the question. I was like, okay, wait a second. Now I can do lat pull downs. I can do pull ups. I can do overhead presses. Uh, I can do seated overhead presses. Uh, I can do curls. I can build up my arms. I could build up my upper body. And you start to really think about some of this and like, okay, now we're starting to build some momentum. So there's still a bunch of crap that I can do. Let me, let me hop on that. Let me, let me do all that stuff. I can also rehab the knee. That's going to help burn some calories as well. But on top of all that, stay on your diet or refocus on your diet. If you're, if you're listening to this podcast right now and you're kind of known as a bigger guy or known for, for, for some strength and you're, you're tuning in because I'm on here as a power lifter, um, you know, by all means, you, you hurt your shoulder and you can't be that strong guy anymore. You, you can't be attached to that same identity anymore. That is a really sad spot to be in. And it sucks. And I've been there a bunch of times. The best thing that you can do is work on being leaner, work on dropping some weight. Um, take that time and say, you know what? I'm going to lose 40 pounds, man. I can't take this anymore. I'm not going to be this big. Lose that weight. You are going to lose some strength. But when you come back and as you start to rebuild, if you want to gain a little bit of that weight back, not all of it, you want to gain a little bit of that weight back, that's okay. Fluff up and uh, hit some more big lifts. But after every powerlifting meet I ever did, I always lost weight. And it didn't matter what weight class I competed in, um, I would compete. I would be as big as I possibly could be, and boom, I'd strip down about 20 pounds. And a lot of that had to do – that was to try to stay healthy. That was to try to stay in shape. Every single time I competed, I always reset my carbohydrate tolerance by doing a ketogenic diet. You jump on a ketogenic diet and it's going to, uh, in most cases, it's going to, you're going to be able to improve, uh, your, your reaction to the carbohydrates that you eat. So if you think about it as you're going into this, this powerlifting meat or bodybuilding show and you're eating tons and tons of food to be big and to be strong and to do all these things, when you're done with the show, there's going to be, or powerlifting meet, there's going to be like a rebound. And in powerlifting, you don't lift that much before the meet, a week before the meet. And usually the week after, you kind of can't even barely lift because you're half dead. It takes you almost a full month to get kind of back into the swing of things. And so your caloric activity is, is way, way down. And so that's a great opportunity, great chance for you to figure out, all right, well, let's, I, I lifted, I did well. I lifted some big weights. 
let me work on getting back in shape. And also when you're hurt, I highly advise anyone that, that has gotten hurt or anybody that knows anybody has gotten hurt, say, Hey man, you should, you should, uh, focus in on your diet and not let yourself, you know, gain 40 pounds. Like what happened to you when you went to uh, school to be a dentist? Yeah. So that's a, that's a tough one. And, and again, it's tough to blame doctors because they have a field of knowledge. They've been to a certain amount of schooling. And so they're, they're doing things within their, I guess, you know, knowledge base, but it's always great to get second and third consultations. Um, what my athletic therapist said was that there was a partial tear in my meniscus according to the ultrasound. But he also said that, you know, and you touched on this is, um, that could have been there from years ago. That could have been there for me playing soccer in high school. That could have been there for me just squatting for so many years. Um, and like you said, that it could have been the same in my other knee. And that was such a crude way of looking at an injury and assessing it uh, for the long term like that. And and I could have stopped exercising. I could have fallen into that trap. And people really, they identify themselves with whatever sport or exercise they're currently doing. It becomes part of their identity. You see that a lot with people who get injured let's say they're on their way to getting an NFL football contract and they blow out their knee. And now that identity of them being a football player and and going that way in in their life, it completely takes a hold of them. And it's hard for people to rebound out of those dark spaces. Um, So holding on to something, uh, whether you turn to something else in your life or you focus on your business, your personal relationships, or you start taking your diet more seriously um, is important. And I've had multiple injuries. Like I've broken my wrist, I've broken my nose, I've broken my ankle, I've broken just about anything. And it always led to me. Yeah. I mean, you know what? I've always just been curious with other sports, like my ankle injury. I started playing hockey four years ago. And the reason I started playing hockey was because I looked at myself and I said, there's no excuse for me not learning this sport. Yeah. I told myself that, Oh, I never did it growing up. So it's kind of the end of it for me. But I was like, I'm 22 years old. Like there's no reason why I can't do this if I really want to. So I got a bunch of equipment. My buddy took me on the ice, did a couple skating lessons basically with him, started going out to, um, a shinny during the day which is basically stick and puck with a bunch of grown men and then I, I started joining men's teams and the rest was history and so one of my uh you know first the first year i started skating i flew into the boards at full speed cool. and i broke my ankle like my you know the way that skates are built you know they they kind of strap you in tight so if you go head on to anything you're kind of <laughs> screwed and so that was i think that was just like maybe six months into me learning how to skate but it, it's just my my approach to every single sport exercise business, whatever it is. It's like, I'm always an all in mentality. When I started playing hockey, I didn't see myself being a mediocre player. I thought, I really thought that I could get really good by just putting in the work. And I, it just prevented me from ever slowing down and taking things slow. I had to be fast. I had to learn quickly. And if I didn't, that's what happened. I would fly into the boards, you know, going way too fast for my ability. Uh, same thing that happened when I was snowboarding. I just, I wanted to push limits and that's kind of how you get better. And even though I got injured through my injuries, I learned a lot about um, you know, certain exercises that I could do. So when I broke my ankle, I had a buddy pick me up every night, went to the gym and I worked on my shoulders and my lats and I would do strict pull-ups, which I had never really done before, yeah. but it gave me this opportunity to build certain muscles that were neglected over time. And it kind of take myself out of that scenario and look at it objectively and go, all right, well, I'm in this now, this is what happened. And what can I do to develop myself mentally and physically in the meanwhile? And it, it always worked. I mean, there was hard times in the first week or two where you're kind of in denial about what happened Mm -hmm. and, and you're really just depressed. Right. And so it takes a certain amount of uh, self-awareness to get yourself out of that slump and to get yourself back on track with whatever it is. Cause at the end of the day, like there's certain things you can do, certain things in your power. Um, and just ask for help. You know, when anytime I ask for help, like, Hey, do you mind picking me up and driving me to the gym? Sure. It was never really an issue. I think a lot of people take that pride and they don't want to uh, allow other people to help them. Uh, I think it's more an ego thing, but basically just shutting down that pride, asking for help and focusing on what you can do is probably the most important thing in a circumstance of injury or setback. What kind of uh, goals do you have right You know, at the moment? Uh, you know what? Basically, it's this, from the time that I finished school earlier this year, and I've been building this business for about two years now. And so we've moved more into the supplement industry. We have our own line of supplements. My main priority is to grow the business, but in terms of fitness, I mean, I've kind of just always been focused on getting good at sports that I like, so I'll never give up hockey no matter what, but I do CrossFit. I've been doing CrossFit for about three years. Um, I love the sport. We had Patrick Veller on the show a couple weeks ago, and it was just, 
I see him all the time. He trains at our gym, but it was amazing to sit down and talk to him about his journey with CrossFit. And so I really enjoy CrossFit, but I also like bodybuilding. I'm kind of stuck in that middle yeah. ground where uh, I love being a meathead, but I also believe that you should be functionally fit. I don't necessarily love doing burpees and thrusters and wall balls and doing cardio till I want to throw up. But I believe that it's good for you to push your limits. And the reason that I stuck with CrossFit after trying it for the first time, because if you've ever tried CrossFit, you, you want to puke the first time you do it. And it never really changes after that. It's not like bodybuilding where you finish a session and you have all these endorphins running and you feel amazing about yourself. The more in shape you get with CrossFit, the worse you feel when you finish a workout. It pushes you to your limits every single time you do it, and you never feel like you're in shape. You never really feel like you're getting better because as soon as you start to get better, you push yourself even harder in another workout. And it's like this cycle where you're like, am I really even going anywhere? So for me, it's about um, just staying in shape. Uh, I want to be fit. And now recently, I've been focusing on my goals a little bit more on being strong. I want to get a little bit bigger than I used to. Um, and just just being functional for me after bodybuilding for so many years, you know, my shoulders were kind of getting destroyed. My pecs were way too tight. There were certain movements that I couldn't even do. When I came to CrossFit, I tried to do ring muscle ups and my elbows blew up. I couldn't, I couldn't do a front rack squat because my elbows and my lats were so tight. Yeah. And at that point I realized there was a problem and I looked good. I mean, I had been doing a keto diet and bodybuilding for a while and I looked good. Like, I mean, I had abs, I, I had a good physique, but what was I able to do physically? And at that point, I was like, well, I don't really want to get that much bigger. And so it's time for me to to get myself aerobically fit, functionally fit. I never really squatted that much before that. I just kind of benched and got my upper body bigger. I was blessed to have good genetics and I had big legs growing up. I just figured I didn't need to train them. And so, you know, it would come time for me to go out and play a sport. And I was just gassed. And I realized like, okay, so you look good, but then what? And so that led me to CrossFit. I remember uh, my first day, actually, I have a twin sister who who started CrossFit a year before me. And we've been competitive growing up because we're twins. And she's always been very active and, and probably, you know, way more fit than me growing up. So I had to try to find a way to keep up with her. So we got into the CrossFit gym. I remember my first day and I hated it. I mean, I, I actually I felt like I was going to die. But I, I looked at her. She beat me in the workout. And I was like, yeah, this isn't going to end now. So I'm three years in and we we still work out almost every single day. Uh, a lot of times it's side by side and, you know, CrossFit is scaled. So the men and women weights are according to uh, whatever they're prescribed as for uh, men and women. So it's basically a really great test of your fitness that you can kind of compare to. And it's a competitive environment. So you put your score up on the board at the end of the day. Right. And that's a big motivation is like some people look at that and they're like, oh, should you really be like comparing and you want to focus on your personal goals? But like you want to come in and you want to compete. You want to throw up a good score. You want to push your body to its limits. And that allows me to do it on a micro level. Every day I can get in a little bit of competition. And for anyone that knows me, I'm a hyper competitive guy. If you talk about anything from a board game to any small challenge, like I really I feel this urge to do my best at it. And CrossFit kind of challenged me to do that. Uh, I'm not very good at CrossFit, I would say. I mean, I'm, I'm a decently fit guy, but it's just, it's an insane sport that requires a lot of time and discipline. And I think it's always been in the background for me to stay fit. Even if it's a 20 minute wad, it's going to push you to your limits and you're going to feel, you're going to feel gassed and, and, and accomplished at the end of it. So that was a big thing for me right now. My goals are basically stay in shape and just try to get jacked if I can. Yeah. I think, you know, it's important for people to kind of hang on to some of these goals. And then how do you how do you line things up to make some of those goals happen, you know, to, to have some of those things kind of in your, in your, uh, eyesight, like, how do you, you know, how do you, you know, stay on point to, to make sure some of these things happen? And there's, there's a bunch of little things you can do, but, uh, the little, you know, the little stuff that you don't want to do when you don't normally want to do it is where the leverage of life is. It's where all the secrets of the world exist in all the small things that we typically just don't want to do. Even for example, like th this is kind of a weird, uh, you know, weird thing to, to bring up, but like, you know, cross in CrossFit gyms, it's very common to work out in very minimal amount of clothes, right? A lot of the guys take their shirts off and girls are like in a sports bra. And then you kind of notice, wow, like, man, everybody in here is pretty jacked. Like everyone here is pretty lean. There's girls with abs and there's guys with veins going through their abs and their biceps and forearms and stuff. And you're like, holy crap. Um, well, 
there's there's multiple things going on. Number one, these are people that committed to fitness, right? They committed to fitness. Uh, most of them have committed to fitness uh, to the fullest. You know, it's a 24 hour process. They they understand they need to sleep, they need to eat, and they need to train. They understand that all those things are are very important factors uh, in their in their conditioning. They also train very hard, right? All these things are factors, but the simple act of them taking their shirts off uh, forces them to be leaner because the, most of the, I mean, mo, most of these CrossFitters are in pretty damn good shape and, and taking your shirt off is an accountability. You know, if, if Rich Froning's next to you and Matt Frazier, they pop their shirt off and you kind of look at him and you're like, oh shit, like I don't really look like that, right? Well, what about three weeks from then or four weeks from then? May, I bet you that you're probably, if you're kind of looking up to these guys and this is what you want to do and you want to be part of this environment, you're probably saying to yourself, you know, I need to kind of talk to these guys about diet because I don't really look like that. So I'm not really sure what's going on, but I want to figure it out. Next thing you know, you're popping your shirt off too. What happens on that is once that happens, you're going to, you're going to kind of have to do that all the time. And that means that you'll have to be in shape all the time. So Christmas comes around, Thanksgiving comes around, your birthday comes around. It's like, you're, you know, you don't want to be the one guy doing the muscle ups with the love handles. And you don't want to be the one guy with your fat jiggling everywhere. Every time you guys go outside for a run and it's just, it's something that you start to kind of think about. So you know, having some of these goals and having some things where you're like, this is what I want to try to do. And then these are the four or five things that I need to do to get there. And something as silly as taking your shirt off while you're training can lead to that. And if that's way too big of a thing for you to do, which it is for most, take some pictures, take some photos of yourself. Um, and also, and this is a huge thing at my house, I have uh, mirrors that are behind me as well, because seeing the back of your body is hugely important. So I know some of this might sound like, oh my God, like guy keeps looking at himself in the mirror. It's not anything like that at all. It's, it's a body, it's a body of work. It's something that I've been trying to work on for a really long time. And it wasn't until like earlier this year that I really felt good with having my shirt off. Like I don't, not that that's even a goal, but it feels really good to when somebody says, Hey man, how you doing? I could say wife's doing great. Kids are doing great. Business is kicking ass and I'm in the best shape of my life. That feels so good to be able to say that. I can't even explain in words how good that feels to be able to say that. That feels way better than saying uh, that I even benched 900 pounds or some of the crazy shit I've, I've done in the past. That feels so good to say I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm really comfortable uh, with, with what I've built. And yes, just like anybody else, there's room to like, I could bring this up or I could scale back on that or whatever. Right. But, uh, this accountability for the goals that you have is really, really important. So I always encourage people as funny as it might sound, get a, uh, you know, get a mirror that allows you to see the back of your body as well. Cause you're going to be like, Oh my God, I didn't know my love handles looked like that. I didn't know my butt looked that way. I didn't know I had fat gear. And it will piss you off, but it will also force you just like your friend did when he teased you about seeing your belly, right? What if he never did that? It's like, you know, you, you owe that guy 20 bucks at least <laughs> or, or a Christmas card or something, you know, because that's a, that's a, those things are big deals. And like, he probably didn't mean to like upset you, but at the same time that set forth, uh, basically like almost like your whole career, if you kind of think about it, right. Cause it, it kind of led you into this phase of like getting fascinated with diet and exercise right yeah that was like the for me that was the the tipping point because i remember going home that day and i was like i don't know what to do but i'm gonna do 100 sit-ups and 100 push-ups and i'll see what i'll do the next day after that and so that was the starting point in reading articles on bodybuilding.com and researching the internet and that was kind of the start of the journey for me and i think there's always that thing that really pisses people off and it's a trigger right it might come from a family or a friend and it just depends on how you take that and turn it into momentum. A lot of people can sulk on it and ask themselves why this person said this thing to hurt my feelings. Or you can use that anger the same way you would in a gym to kind of hit that PR, whether you're on a bench or a deadlift or squat, whatever it might be. 
you can use that anger to really drive you. And it's a, it's a huge, there's so much opportunity in using anger for momentum. I think people miss that. Um, and going back to just getting in the gym and being able to hold yourself accountable. When I first started my business, it was when I started my master's degree. At that point, I had turned down my acceptance to dental school. I chose to chase my passion in my career, which was in diet and nutrition. And so it was an easy process, as I'm sure you and a lot of business owners know. And so I was starting my business. I was finishing my master's degree, and I was still waiting tables. And I was waiting tables multiple nights a week, including Friday and Saturday. And I did that for six years. And so I basically sacrificed my weekends for, you know, 18 or whatever it was and and that was those were like some critical years to go out and enjoy your weekends and what i did was i chose to invest that time into making money when other people wanted to go out and i think the reason that the service industry treated me so kindly was because i found that uh, the harder you work the more money you make and when people want to rest you can work and that's always the, the best time to to get stuff done and so i gave up my weekends and i remember quite clearly a lot of times and i was teaching for the university as well at the time as a ta so a lot of my Fridays look like this. I would get up at 5.36. I'd do my teaching in the morning. I'd have to do my lab work. Then I would rush over and try to get a workout in between 3 and 4. I'd have to be at the restaurant for 4.30 where I would work till probably 12.31 in the sure. morning. I would get up the next day at uh, 8 or 9 a.m. I would get into the gym. I would do my hour of working out, get home shower, and then I'd head to the rush, restaurant. And from there, I'd work probably from 12 till 10 at night. And so those are my weekends. That's how I ended my week of already putting in time in the gym, in school, and in my business. And so for me, it was like zero excuses. It's either you choose to have that free time or you make time for what's important for you. And the gym was always incredibly important for me. And I honestly don't think that I would have survived those uh, 18-hour days if it wasn't for that 30 to 60-minute gym session. Because I was pretty tired getting into the gym at the end of the day. But it kind of gave me that feel to go for round two from four in the afternoon till midnight. And I, I can tell you, like, without a doubt, that if I didn't go into that gym for 45 minutes, I would not have been able to get through my day. And people don't realize, like, yeah, you might be tired getting to the gym, but you're going to feel, like, incredible once you leave. You never regret a workout. No one once on planet Earth has ever left the gym and been like, ah, damn, I shouldn't have done that workout. It's just not going to happen. Well, I always try to share with people, too, just, you know, just uh, schedule it, you know, like, you know what your day looks like. I know there's some people that will say, oh, well, I'm an entrepreneur. I work for myself and I got weird hours or, you know, I'm a nurse or a doctor or whatever. And you got these, you're on call 24 seven, but whatever the case is, you kind of sort of at least know what every day looks like. Um, everybody in their life has some form of like downtime. Like you can schedule your, you can schedule your workouts and it's, what I would advise is, is have, have a schedule, have a regimen, have a routine. Um, it's not a great idea to work out at 8 a.m. one day and 4 p.m. the next and 8 a.m. the next day and 3 o'clock and 12 and try to, you know, have it be somewhat uniform. Um, you you got to sometimes, ha- you know, audible and make it happen when it has to happen because you're going out of town or something else is happening. And that's not really what I'm talking about. But in general, you have a, a general idea of what every single day looks like. Your kids go to school at this day, uh, at this time of day, every single day. Um, you end up at your office around this time every single day. Like you basically have an idea. Like don't be an idiot. Don't be blind to it. Just know that you have that knowledge. Like you kind of know what each day looks like. Write it out. You know, put it down on paper and say, you know what, just no matter what, at 7 a.m. every day, uh, that's where I'm going to be. I'm going to be training. You know, you just it's that's when it happens. And it's not it's not a debate. It's not it's not up for debate with your girlfriend or wife or significant other. It's not anything anyone can talk you out of or that's your time. That's scheduled. That's just think about it as a paycheck. Think, you know, take it that seriously. This is my time to do this. And it's not it's not anything we're going to you know, move out of the way. Cause I know a lot of people, they're like, Oh yeah, I think I'm going to get go. Like I might go like after the, after our, after work today. And then, you know, it's six o'clock, they're stuck in traffic and their girlfriend calls and say, Hey, let's go check out that new restaurant. It's like, that's of course, that's a way better. That's way more fun than going and, uh, you know, doing squats and leg presses and walking lunges. Right. Yeah. I think with the couple things is important. I've seen a lot of people who, especially in their 20s, to get into relationships and they, for some reason, feel this urge to spend every single day together, every single night. 
And I never really understood that because, first of all, how are you going to miss each other and appreciate each other if you're spending every single second of the day together? Second of all, if you don't prioritize yourself and have things that you enjoy for yourself, then how are you going to be happy and thus happy in your relationship? And I found that people who say, you know, this night is for seeing my girlfriend, this night is for going to the gym or this time slot or whatever it may be, they end up being much happier in the relationship. And if they're, you know, their significant other does the exact same, then they're happy when they see each other. But if you don't prioritize the gym, you both end up, you know, eating garbage. You're probably going to go out to restaurants. You're going to get overweight and then you're both going to be unhappy with each other. And I've, I've seen this a lot. I've seen this happen to a lot of people. And because I worked in the restaurant industry, I saw it a lot. There were a lot of regular couples that would come in and they were very unhappy. And I thought to myself, you guys should be at the gym right now. If you had just done a 45 minute workout with each other, you would have had the same date night and uh, you probably would have left a little bit happier than you are right now. Um, and <clears throat> jumping a little bit into powerlifting because you know I'm, I'm fascinated by powerlifting i love it as a sport um where do you see that in terms of you know testing fitness levels in general because i know you know crossfit is a pretty good test of fitness and you know they refer to you know the fittest on earth as their competition um and i see a lot of powerlifting and strongman leaking into crossfit i see that being strong has always been um an, an important thing to have i think if you look at life scenarios uh, you know, if something happens or let's say you need to rescue someone from a certain situation, being strong is an asset. I, I think that from a primitive level, uh, strength, uh, like right. you say, is never a weakness. Uh, but where, where do you see powerlifting going into the future in terms of sport and its ability to invade other sports and training programs? I know a lot of college football players and hockey players are turning to powerlifting now to get stronger in their sport as well. Uh, the kind of idea of powerlifting in general, um, hits every facet of every basis of every single thing that you would ever need to do in any sports endeavor or anything that you just do in life, period, um, it is kind of the backbone, the cornerstone of, uh, fun fundamental movement. Um, a bench press is probably the one kind of weird one that's in there, uh, for multiple reasons. Um, but Squat, bench press, deadlift is what comprises powerlifting. And it's not powerlifting. It's not a powerlifting meet unless you are doing one rep maxes. And you get the opportunity to – you start out with squat and a powerlifting meet and you you do um, – you, I'm sorry, you go uh, – you get three attempts at the squat and you're judged by three judges. You get three attempts in the bench press and you're judged by three judges. And you get three attempts in the deadlift. And there's different rules and different federations and so on. But powerlifting, having the squat, bench, and deadlift really throws some major curveballs your way because if you have long arms and you're kind of tall, odds of you having long arms and being tall and having a large, large hands is probably pretty high. Well, that puts you at a great advantage for something like a deadlift. Well, now if you kind of have long legs, though, and a short torso, that also puts you at a huge advantage for the deadlift. But then it also kind of screws you up for something like a squat. And then it really might throw you off for something like a bench press because you got these long ass arms and you got this high range of motion that you got to try to deal with for the bench press. So powerlifting, while it looks so simple, is actually extremely complicated. It's a complex thing to try to figure out how do I get uh, efficient at all three of these lifts? This is going to be kind of a tough thing to figure out. Um, the squat. You know, some people have labeled the squat as kind of the king of all exercises. Um, some people feel that the deadlift is kind of the fundamental movement of, of, of all lifting, period, whether it be Olympic lifting, uh, a strongman CrossFit. You see a lot of deadlifting in CrossFit. You know, th these, movements are, these movements are not new. They've been around for a very long time. Um, and they are the backbone of strength sports. They are the backbone of building strength and being powerful and also building hypertrophy because, uh, you know, the, your body's going to be able to pack on more muscle mass, um, through a time under tension, which is just the amount of time that you're lifting for, um, the overall amount of volume that you can handle in a given workout and also the intensity, which is the amount of weight that you can use. So if you can, somebody who can handle 405 on a bench press for sets of for three sets of 10, is probably going to be a pretty big jacked dude. You know, that's going to be a pretty big, strong uh, individual that can handle that amount of work and that amount of volume or 
even a girl that can uh, deadlift 315 for multiple sets of, of five um, is probably going to have uh, pretty good size in the hamstrings and in the hips and in the butt uh, to be able to handle those kinds of weights. Um, so powerlifting is, is hugely important to all sports, uh, all the way to bodybuilding even because, the more, again, the more weight that you can handle, uh, not necessarily the more size you're going to have, but the more weight you can handle, the more weight you can handle in your workouts, the more load you can put on your body, the larger uh, the body is going to want to become. Your body's going to want to adapt by slapping on more muscle mass. Not always. That doesn't always work that way. It's not a one-to-one ratio, and that's why you sometimes see some guys deadlift 700, but they weigh you know, 170 or 180, and you're like, whoa, that guy's crazy strong for how small he is. Um, but powerlifting, you know, I, I see powerlifting continuing to grow because of those reasons and because people are starting to really understand that, man, being strong can really be a big deal. I also think that like a real small amount of powerlifting can go a long way. We talked about the power of carbohydrates and how you could probably have, you know, 20, 40, 60, 80, maybe 100 grams a day and that could really really spike your day and that there might be some high level athletes um even like someone like zach bitter who's you know running 100 miles and different things like that who can really benefit from even just that small amount of carbohydrates but there's a lot of fighters there's a lot of um there's a lot of football players there's a lot of baseball players uh there's a lot of athletes out there that could benefit from small amounts of powerlifting. They don't have to be a powerlifter. They don't have to commit to, all right, how am I going to figure out how to bench squat and deadlift every week and and raise my total? They don't necessarily have to think in that context, but they should be working on how to increase their one rep max squat, even if they don't one rep max squat often or even at all. But um, they should be thinking about how do I increase the strength of my legs and my hips? And you're not going to do it with some of these bullshit exercises that you see people doing. Um, you see so many athletes, you know, working on these drills where they're like these ladder drills and all these different things. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, a lot of that stuff is kind of worthless. Like you're already you're and the reason why coaches do it is because they're already placating to what the what the athlete wants to do and what the athletes are already good at. The athletes feel so comfortable doing that. But you don't want to make your athletes comfortable. You want them. You want to make them uncomfortable, and you want them to engage in stuff that's really, really challenging. And so I understand you don't want to hurt them, and you certainly don't want to slow them down. And you certainly could with, uh, if you deadlifted 52 weeks out of the year and you went really heavy all the time, your uh, MMA athlete would probably get his ass knocked out because he'd probably start to slow down because he wouldn't be recovering from those workouts. So you have to be smart about it. And you'd have to kind of put it in there at the right times. And you would have to be sophisticated with the idea of like, okay, deadlifting from the floor is great, but that range of motion costs us a lot. And uh, maybe, you know, partial range of motions might be better to uh, in- incorporate maybe one, t- maybe uh, one week they go light and do speed work. And maybe the next week they go heavy. You got a lot of options at your hands, but powerlifting will continue to grow. Um, something that's extraordinary that has happened is the, this idea of leaving behind, uh, this, this kind of, uh, being so worried about your aesthetics and, and trying to be like skinny and trying to, um, a lot of women trying to be just thinner and smaller. Um, I'm, I'm really glad I'm really, really happy to see a lot of that, go, a lot of that fall away because, um, so many women were confused and they were doing, they were cardio bunnies and they were not eating any food and they were trying to do cardio all the time. And it wasn't producing the body that they wanted. A lot of females started to enter into powerlifting and powerlifting exploded. Powerlifting boomed. And that's from CrossFit. That is a direct correlation from CrossFit because more people had more barbells in their hands and Instagram, CrossFit, all that started to kind of build up all at the same time. The guys were zooming in on these girls' big butts, and they were excited. The girls were zooming in on these big butts and watching these girls uh, deadlift these extraordinary amounts of weight. And more and more people were like, what is this? This is cool. Wait, this girl actually has some size. She's got some thickness to her hips. She's got some fullness to her butt. Like, what is this sport? And then they're kind of like, wow, that's actually kind of sexy. Like, that's pretty attractive. Like, that, actually, that girl actually looks great. 
and she just deadlifted 400 freaking pounds. Like what guy or girl doesn't want to be part of that? That looks encouraging. It looks fun. And then you're seeing, uh, you know, also in CrossFit, a lot of these, a lot of these guys are deadlifting 500 pounds, 600 pounds. These are drug tested athletes, whether they do stuff or not. I have no idea, but they, they get, they get drug tested. They don't, they don't weigh a lot. They're not, they, these are not 275 pound people. These are guys that weigh 190 pounds that are not deadlifters that are not, uh, deadlifting all the time yet. They're ripping up these big weights. They, uh, they're, they're running, they're jumping, they're, um, doing their burpees and uh, all these other movements that they do in CrossFit. And it's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And it's, it's, it's helped the growth of our sport. Um, in addition to that, you know, guys like Stan Efforting coming into our sport and, um, uh, he's somebody you should have on the podcast with his, uh, vertical diet information. You guys can talk it out about keto and stuff too, but, uh, Stan has really helped popularize this sport. And I think a lot of the work that he did, he and I did together at super training, um, with him showing people, look, man, you don't have to be fat to lift heavy weights. You just need to be strong and you just need to be in shape for it. You just need to be prepared for it. Um, having some extra fluff and extra junk in the trunk, it can help a little bit with, uh, lifting more weight, but it's not, it's not the only thing that can help you lift more weight. And so I think that powerlifting is going to continue to grow. I think it's going to continue to soar and uh, I'm, it's, it's exciting for me because I love the sport. The, the, you know what? It's crazy how far things have come and I love it, especially with, uh, the image of what women believe is strong what women believe is beautiful has completely revolutionized in the last decade and just seeing women feel empowered to be strong be able to move heavy weight and not be scared or embarrassed about you know what a small community of simple-minded men or women have to say about it uh, is probably the most impressive thing especially with social media you see that a lot of these insecure men will come on women who power lift or women who do crossfit and and just the comments they write it's just a pure exposure of their male insecurity uh and it's embarrassing for them it's embarrassing for me to see that because i know how hard it is to create a strong healthy body and i know the work that gets put in and it, it really is upsetting to see but i love that that is fading now and it's becoming the norm to be strong and fit um and and doing it through power lifting i think just those three movements plus some accessory work and a good diet is all you really need to get pretty damn fit um and i guess uh yeah we can just wrap things up with you know if you had a piece of advice for women who are maybe scared to squat or deadlift for the first time and they're you know they haven't really even exercised or maybe they've been exercising for a little bit like what what would you recommend how could they start and and how can they kind of be successful with that yeah i think uh you know anyone that's uh a little bit nervous about getting into powerlifting should uh probably the first thing to do, it might be to go to a powerlifting meet. Um, that's something you can easily look up online. You can go to like powerliftingwatch.com. You can also just kind of poke around on like Instagram and you might find uh, some different uh, information about powerlifting meets, but try to find a local powerlifting contest and then figure out where are these powerlifters, powerlifters coming from. You know, uh, there's probably a local gym that you didn't even know has powerlifting in it, or there also could be, um, there, there also could be some powerlifting coaches there. Maybe there's a gym close by and you just had no idea that it even existed. But it, it, meanwhile, it has uh, everything you need to be a better powerlifter. You can also look into some CrossFit gyms. CrossFit has all the fundamentals down. Um, bench pressing is not really a super popular thing in CrossFit, but they definitely have the fundamentals down, the basics down of a squat, and they have the basics down of a deadlift. And so um, you could probably go to a CrossFit facility, have someone, you know, show you, have someone kind of, you know, sh show you some of the ropes. But even in a lot of your local gyms, if you see someone deadlifting or someone squatting um, and you see they kind of have like the powerlifting belts, they're trying to sneak their chalk around. And you could just ask those people, hey, you know, what? I want to kind of know more about that. Like, what, what are you guys doing? And you can start to get involved. Most people will be pretty positive. Um, if you're a woman and you're worried about, you know, some of the guys being creepers, then you might want to try to find like some, a professional, you might want to try to find a coach or, um, or a uh, trainer or something like that to, uh, kind of show you the ropes, but really going to a power thing meet, I think is, is probably one of the best things that you can do because when you go to a power thing meet or like, for example, we just had a, a contest in uh, Dublin, California, and we live streamed it and there was thousands and thousands of people watching this event. 
And there was a lot of people um, who were like, oh, my God, like, I didn't know, like, women could, do, like, lift like that. Like, there were some girls that deadlifted 500 pounds. There was one girl that deadlifted 600 pounds. Um, and and just that that idea right there of, like, oh, wow, like, maybe I could, maybe I could, you know, go and compete. And maybe you can't lift the same amount of weight that that girl did. But uh, it gives you the idea of, like, oh, wow, like, that's pretty cool. Like I see all these different girls lifting and I see all these different guys lifting. Maybe this is something, uh, that, that wouldn't be that hard for me to, uh, try, you know, to at least try. So that's what I would start with is, is try to find a power team meet, uh, that's local and then go from there. That's awesome advice. Um, for anyone listening, you got to start somewhere. And, uh, if you want to try it, then it's just uh, holding yourself accountable, I guess. But Mark, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure. I feel like I could talk to you for 10 hours straight. Um, there's an endless stuff. So hopefully we can get to do this again down the road. If you want to just let everyone know quickly where to find you uh, on Instagram and if they want to check out some of the Slingshot products uh, where they can head to. Uh, on well. Instagram and Twitter, I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Um, I also have my own podcast called Mark Bell's Power Project. Please check us out on iTunes. And then uh, check us out uh, if you want to buy, you know, slingshots or you want to buy this book, War on Carbs. If you want to check out anything, it's all at markbellslingshot.com. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you, Mark. We'll talk soon. Appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>